An Asset Protection Guide Chapter 1 Asset Protection 1 Asset Protection 1 Asset protection is not letting anyone you don't want take your money away from you including the government. You could be sued, your house or work building could burn down. You could get a divorce and your spouse wants half of all your assets. Lawyers make money filing civil lawsuits. If you've got money, you're a target. Under our legal system, anybody can sue anybody else. Regardless of whether it's justifiable or not on face, you have to go through the trial and let the judge or jury decide. This wastes time and money even if it is a frivolous lawsuit which is why many people settle up front. Some people, encouraged by unscrupulous lawyers, file lawsuits even though they know they're frivolous. They're banking on a quick out-of-court settlement or fantasizing that maybe this is the big one that will make them rich. Expect the possibility of being sued if you have lots of money and slash or run a business. It doesn't matter whether it's justified or not, expect it. It's part of the game of life in America. If you have insurance, your insurance company will manage the case. If you don't, you will have to hire a lawyer and fight it. This is why I state elsewhere, the more of your money you hide by giving it to relatives, burying it, depositing it in banks with alternative identification or take it out of the country, the less anybody including the government can take it from you. Prepare now for a day when either the government tax people or some lawyer with a lawsuit comes after you. If you don't, you could lose everything. You need insurance on all your buildings and vehicles and if you run a business, particularly, retail, you need insurance on that. You need liability insurance in case someone is injured on your property. You may need other types of business insurance, depending on the type of business you run. You can't buy insurance to cover every possible risk so buy an umbrella policy or some kind of comprehensive policy and let it go after that. You can't overworry it. The safest way is to hide most of you assets. Read the exclusions of your insurance policy to see what's not covered and see what the maximum limits are for coverage. You can be sued for ridiculous amounts of money which is why they sell liability insurance for ridiculous amounts of coverage like $10 million or so. Don't go overboard on insurance. If somebody knows that you have a lot of liability insurance, that could be enough to entice them to sue you. The best asset protection puts you in control of all your assets but keeps you shielded from the public eye so people don't know it's you who owns them therefore less inclined to sue. You don't want to be listed in public records as the owner. You want some innocuous business name to be the owner. Limited liability companies are good shields. So is incorporating as a business as a C corporation. You get an annual salary from the company but you don't personally own it. It is an entity separate from you so if you are sued personally, they can't go after that and if the company is sued, they can't go after your personal assets like a house and a car. Through your C corporation, make tax deductible contributions to a defined benefit plan which is really your own retirement plan. You can also create a non-profit corporation where you control the money. The way most lawyers work is that before they file a lawsuit, they check the target out to see what his assets are. If they don't find too many assets, they won't waste their time suing. With real estate, there are land trusts. Transfer ownership of your real estate into land trusts which are owned, beneficial interest, by limited partnership. This protects your personal real estate and you save on taxes because it's not part of your declared income. Under the homestead laws in some states, your home can't be touched regardless of how opulent it is, California, Florida, Massachusetts, New York, Texas. Of these states, Florida and Texas have an unlimited homestead exemption. Most states just give you some equity protection in your house between $5 to $50,000. Five states give you no homestead exemption. Every state has their own laws regarding home nested exemptions. Some have a minimal residency requirement. You have to live there for a certain amount of time before you qualify. Certain things don't qualify for state homestead exemption like IRS and other federal government judgments, state taxes, inheritances, plaintiffs suing for fraud and libel. 
your best bet is to either rent the home you live in and keep the rest of your money in a foreign bank account or constantly get a loan on the equity you have in your home, an equity loan, a second mortgage, so that you have no real equity in your home. All ERISA, Employee Retirement Income Security Act, Qualified Retirement Plans, 401, K, Company Pension Plans, etc., are generally protected from asset plundering although one court decision called the Patterson decision where the plaintiffs successfully argued that the particular 401, K, in question did not meet ERISA standards. Kia plans are generally protected from creditors except when they are a one-man show with the contributor being the beneficiary. IRAs and other retirement plans have less protection subject to the laws of every state. Pensions can't be touched under federal laws. This is why you shouldn't or roll a pension over into an IRA. Keep your money in a pension plan rather than in an IRA. In order to protect the money in an IRA, close it and either take the money offshore, put it in an LLC, invest it in an exempt annuity where it will be protected from creditors or move to a state that protects IRAs from creditors. In Texas, your wages can't be garnished at all. If you're the head of the household, your earnings can't be garnished in Florida. New York protects 90% of a person's wages from garnishment. Every state is different. There are many items that are creditor-proof such as the following. Burial plots. Farm tools. Funds under 529 and other college plans. Furniture in the home. Gifts under the Uniform Gifts to Minors Act. Livestock. Tools of your trade. Vehicles, cars, and trucks up to a certain value. Wedding rings. If you sell an asset protected from creditors, the usual law set by state laws is that you have a certain amount of time before that money becomes available to creditors. Your best bet is to immediately put that money into another protected asset like if you sell your house, buy another one or buy a car and some furniture or something like that. Every state has laws about converting money from a non-exempt source into an exempt source. There has to be a certain time pass before it's safe from creditors or something like that. Converting your non-exempt assets into a non-liable spouse's exempt assets can also be tricky due to the fraudulent transfer laws. Make sure you get expert legal advice before you do any of these things. Some ways to protect wages are to 1. Set yourself up as a corporation. Your wages are paid to the corporation whereupon you take a loan out on the money. 1. Make one of your buddies your main creditor. You owe him the most money so most of the wages that are garnished go to him. By law, they can only garnish so much money. Your garnished money goes to him and he in turn loans the money back to you. Social security is not considered a pension according to ERISA standards so the IRS can pursue social security payments if they want to and creditors can pursue them relative to what their state laws say about it. Most welfare and disability checks are safe from creditors. Most states protect both life insurance and annuities from being plundered by creditors. Some people go all out in their protection by buying annuities in other countries like Switzerland, the Bahamas, etc. Related to this is the Irrevocable Life Insurance Trust slash ILIT which protects you from creditors and estate taxes. According to the Child Support Enforcement Act of 1975, child support payments override any laws that prevent the garnishing of wages. Overall, Florida and Texas are the best states that offer you some protection for your assets if you are sued and a judgment is rendered against you. Remember two things. If you sell an exempt asset, immediately put it into another exempt financial instrument. Always think proactively before the IRS or somebody else comes after you. The simplest way is to get a stash of your assets in cash or gold form and hide it very well around your premises not necessarily within your house because the IRS often conduct blitz searches on unsuspecting targets where, armed with search warrants, they barge in looking for all cash, valuables, and paperwork for foreign accounts. In order to practice good asset protection, you need to find a good lawyer. There may or may not be a lawyer in your area specifically referring to him or herself as an asset protection attorney. If not, look for estate lawyers, corporate lawyers, and bankruptcy lawyers and find an asset protection attorney from that bunch. Also look for an asset protection planner or consultant.
try your yellow pages or look up the following terms in search engines. Asset Protection Attorney, the name of your city or state. Asset Protection Planner slash Consultant, the name of your city or state. If you can't find one in your home state, don't despair. Because there are so few of these asset protection professionals out there, they often take cases nationally. Hire one from any state but never forget the most important rule of all, the same rule I stated in the first section of this book about being a smart cookie. It's your money. Never trust anyone with it too closely. I saw a report on a PBS documentary about some big-time accountants at KPMG who left this one guy high and dry after they got caught advising him on some harebrained illegal asset protection scheme telling him all the while that it was legal. Educate yourself. Learn how the system operates then make your own decisions. Asset Protection 2 America is lawsuit crazy which is why you have to be proactive in protecting your assets. You have to hide your wealth such that it is untouchable by anyone but you. There are many ridiculous claims filed all the time plus the fact that the IRS can file a claim on you anytime they feel like it. Some other financial hotspots are Bankruptcy Credit problems Divorce Government seizures other than the IRS for breaking some law Most people live in passive bliss, not realizing that anybody can sue them their assets get frozen and they can't touch them until the lawsuit is resolved. I read the stories after the fact written by the Andre people who once trusted the system but now have scorn for it because they were eaten alive by either seemingly silly lawsuits or by the IRS. The fact is that one lawsuit can wipe you out financially, emotionally, and health-wise due to the stress involved. Asset protection sounds like a dirty word that smacks of illegal activities but it can be perfectly legal if you follow the law in your asset protection methods. There is nothing wrong with hiding your money. It makes good financial sense. The more money and high profile you have, the more likely you are to get sued. Professionals and business owners are the most likely targets. Liability insurance only covers certain kinds of lawsuits. There are many policy exclusions. Liability insurance usually has a cap of $100,000 or so whereas lawsuits can easily be filed for multi-millions of dollars. If people win judgments against you, they can't collect if the accountee find your money. It's that simple. When you act geniac middle class as opposed to wealthy, you don't stick out as a target as much. Make it look as though you are not worth suing. Buy some liability insurance. If you are sued and a judgment is rendered against you, offer some kind of settlement equal to about 10% of the judgment and negotiate from there. Keep saying that it's all you got. There are exemption laws that make some of your assets immune to lawsuits and creditors like your house, homestead exemption, the tools of your trade, etc. Florida has good exemption laws. Put your assets in another legal instrument other than you personally like in corporation, limited partnership, limited liability company, offshore trust, etc. With asset protection, do not put all your assets in one place or in one instrument. Diversify. Spread it around over several places. There is no standard formula for asset protection. Everybody lives in a unique situation based on where they live and the laws in the area. Educate yourself about the laws in your area. Keep current on the laws. Aside from burying money, there is no total financial privacy because of computer records and software programs that can search a lot of them out in the world. Try to hide your money without getting your name into it. Many offshore trusts are not illegal or don't save on taxes unless you use money in them that you didn't pay taxes on. If you've paid taxes on your income, you have the right to take the rest offshore if you want to. Money laundering is defined as transferring funds by illicit means. Banks everywhere have certain rules that they must follow under due diligence rules where they are expected to know their customers and trust that the money being transferred doesn't come from illegal means. If the fees are too high for a certain financial instrument, shop around for a better deal. It's as easy as doing a few internet searches. Don't look for the lowest P rice though. They are usually rip-offs. Look for somebody with a good reputation charging a reasonable price. 
You don't have to surrender control of your assets in order to keep them protected. There are many Caribbean banks that offer you flexible instruments with a high limit credit or debit card if you want. Asset Protection 3 Asset protection can generally be divided into four categories. Tax planning Estate planning Insurance Other methods If you own much of anything, especially in business, you're a target for a lot of people who see you as a potential cash cow including money-hungry lawyers and others who might want to sue. You have to be wise to this fact of life and protect yourself every way you can. This is why one particular supermarket has cameras covering every inch of their store. When somebody sued them for slipping and falling on a wet floor in the produce department, they went to the camera and saw this guy actually practice his fall several times before he laid down and started whimpering that he fell. The IRS can destroy you completely. So can a lawsuit. There is no way to protect yourself from someone suing you or the government IRS agents from deciding to rake you over the coals. The only thing you can do is to prepare in case it does happen. The most basic line of defense is property insurance and general liability insurance. Variable life insurance is a good way to put money away tax deferred until you retire as an investment and it's life insurance too. Retirement savings plans are immune in some lawsuits and from the IRS I think because you need money to live on when you're old and retired but you better check to make sure. Beyond that, if you're in business, incorporate in order to separate yourself as a person from the company so that in the event of a lawsuit, they won't go after both your company and your personal assets. If you have a lot of holdings, consider starting several corporations rather than just one in order to spread the liability in case you get sued. Some other possible legal strategies are the Family Limited Partnership, the Limited Liability Company and the Living Trust. Abanit.org, protect your assets before lawsuit arises. CO Ownership Info CO ownership of a business, house, car, stocks, bonds, or bank accounts is usually done between a husband and wife, a mother and daughter, friends, or business partners. It might not be such a good idea because if one of the CO owners of any entity gets sued, the creditors could go after the entire CO owned asset plus the fact that the part owner of the asset in question could get sued even if he's not actively using it if the other does something negligent with it like the guy who CO owned a boat with his buddy. His buddy went for a boat ride, hit someone, killed them so as part owner of the boat, he got sued too. There are three basic types of CO ownership situations. Tenancy in common. Joint tenancy. Tenancy by the entirety. The exact definitions of each are tedious. I don't claim to understand the subtle differences of each even after reading about them in a law book but I will give a brief summary here. Tenancy in common. Each part owner of the asset in question owns that part free and clear. They can sell it independently if they want to or bequeath it to someone. If there is a negligence issue on the property, both of you are sued. While creditors cannot go after your half of the property, they can force the sale of it in order to satisfy your partner's debts. You will get your half of the money but it will be a headache to you. Joint Tenancy Each person owns an undivided part of the asset. When one partner dies, ownership goes to the others automatically. This is called the right of survivorship. Such an arrangement is sometimes called joint tenants with the right of survivorship slash JTROS. Tenancy by the entirety. This arrangement is only available to a married couple in about half of the American states. It is a special joint tenancy for couples where neither can sell the asset or change the agreement unless both agree to it. You could look these terms up on the internet to learn more about them but the advice I got was never put anything into joint assets in your own name, even a husband-wife team getting a joint bank account or buying a house together. Even though it may be simpler this way in the convenience sense and has rights of survivorship to it, the other person immediately takes the asset over when the partner dies, the big disadvantage is that if one gets sued, the entire asset is vulnerable to being taken in a judgment. The much better way is to form a corporation, an LLC or a limited partnership as a team or a couple and register your assets as these entities rather than in your own real names. This gives you more protection in case you get sued. The Exemptions on the Exemptions 
The United States federal government through the IRS and other federal agencies can basically ignore every asset protection state law out there. They can even seize your house in Texas or Florida and ignore their homestead laws. The state government can ignore all asset protection laws if it has a claim against you. Divorce and child support laws can supersede the usual asset protection laws if the judge sees fit. He can dip into a person's retirement account to share it with the spouse under a qualified domestic relations order slash QDRO. Whenever you sign a contract with any creditor or for any transaction, there could be something buried in the fine print that renders the usual exemptions void. For example, they can state that if you default on the transaction, they can legally go after your car and house even if they are protected by state law so read all contracts before you sign them. Fraudulent Transfer Guide There are generally three ways to get into trouble using asset protections methods. Fraudulent Transfers Giving your assets a proxy or front owner. Hiding your assets. There are several fraudulent transfer laws. Uniform Fraudulent Conveyance Act Uniform Fraudulent Transfer Act State Fraudulent Conveyance Laws By law a fraudulent transfer is any asset redistribution anybody does to try to get out of paying some kind of judgment regardless of whether it's creditors in bankruptcy or a lawsuit judgment. The judgment creditor will look for evidence that an individual transferred assets and money out of his name in anticipation of a judgment against him or her. They will then typically render these transactions void, put the asset back in the person's name and take it or just render them void and add the value to the creditor's bill. Even though fraudulent transfer sounds like a case of criminal fraud, it is mostly treated as a civil matter. The defendant's lawyer will always argue that his client did it unintentionally which is probably why the judgment creditors don't even bother pursuing criminal charges. They just want to get the money. Be very careful about bankruptcy fraud though. It's considered a very serious crime. If you hide your assets and lie under oath they can charge you criminally for perjury if they ever find those assets. The normal marital privilege in courts that a wife can't testify against her husband and vice versa does not extend to proceedings to discover assets. In most states, a creditor can interrogate a non-debtor spouse about the debtor spouse's financial affairs. Obviously no one can read anyone else's mind so the lawmakers have set up standards that they call badges of fraud. Some of these are as follows. Giving things away. Selling things very cheaply to friends and family. Secretly putting your money away. Buying things under an assumed name. Selling a house or car but continuing to use it. Transfers done soon after an action was filed against the person. Doing a financial transaction that leaves the person impoverished. These badges of fraud could be legitimate transfers done in the course of regular business which is why there has to be some intent of fraud proven. If you sell your house at considerably less than fair market value, that's an indication of fraudulent intent. In order to avoid being accused of fraudulent transfer such that your assets will be reassigned back to you then seized, you must firstly get your assets out of the country as quickly as possible or get in cash form then bury it before any threat of a lawsuit or other judgment is even looming on the horizon. Secondly, don't be stupid and transfer your house to a spouse or relative something like two months before you file for bankruptcy because it will be so obviously fraudulent transfer and the house is still there for the government to take back. You have to sell the house and put the money in a foreign bank account or bury it if you want to be beyond the reach of the law. The test of fraudulent transfer is whether the transaction looks like it was a last-ditch effort to protect one's assets. The only foolproof method is to protect your assets before such a situation ever aries. Once there is some kind of action against you, virtually all attempts at asset protection can be construed as fraudulent transfer. Even if you transfer your assets offshore, creditor investigators can track them down and legally go after them. One bright spot of fraudulent transfer laws is that many creditors don't bother doing extensive investigations on people who owe them money and even when they find fraudulent transfers, they don't always act on them because the cost to recover the assets is so high that it's not worth it to go after them. As far as the law is concerned, creditors and prosecutors don't look for fraudulent transfer until after a judgment is rendered then they start looking for the money. Even after you get a lawsuit filed against you, 
you can still try to get rid of some assets and hope they either won't investigate or if they do, it will be too costly for them to bother trying to recover your assets. Don't even bother thinking that putting your house in your wife's name or in some other straw slash nominee entity like in the name of a foreign corporation will protect it. It won't. Sell your house, put the money in a foreign account or bury it then rent a place to live. With the computerization of all records, it's not that hard to find anyone's financial records on virtually every thing they've ever done. There are professional asset search firms and forensic accounting firms that creditors use to search a paper trail to see where assets were transferred to so the lesson is to be very careful when setting out to hide your assets. The safest way is always to get it in cash then take it to another country and put it into a bank account there. Forfeiture Guide the Crime Control Act of 1984 has a provision whereby police can keep what they confiscate. In many cases, the person doesn't even have to be charged criminally, the police just state they believe the person was involved in criminal matters. The person could fight it in court but that will cost legal fees so many people just give up and take the loss. Government authorities can seize houses, cars, etc. just because they believe you are committing crimes with them and don't have to prove it in court. Recently, several courts have determined that if your property is seized and then you are charged criminally for an offense, this constitutes double jeopardy but the Supreme Court struck this ruling down so forfeiture laws are currently a muddled mix with two clearly defined sides, those for it and those against it. If you want your property back, the burden is on you to prove you are not guilty of whatever crime they claim you committed. They make it hard for you to initiate legal proceedings to get your stuff back. You have only 10 to 20 days to file a claim for a federal seizure. They took all your stuff so you have no money, no car, no house, they won't give you a legal aid attorney and you have to post a bond equal to 10% of the value of the property. All manner of federal police have gotten in on the free money like the Park Police, the Wildlife Service, Health and Human Services, Coast Guard, Postal Service, Customs and even the Secret Service who are responsible for guarding the President. Local and state police departments have filled their coffers this way. Louisiana state troopers have been the subject of a TV network investigative report. Typically, the police confiscate money and property then buy new cars for themselves, go to conventions, so-called seminars, etc. At such places as Hawaii and Vegas and buy nice things for their social clubs and lunch rooms. If you're the innocent victim of forfeiture, go to the media and contact a civil rights lawyer. New Jersey has a law whereby your property can be confiscated based on any criminal convictions like if you shoplift something, the store is entitled to make you pay them something in addition to your court fine. Several states are now punishing people like contractors and businessmen in civil matters simply by confiscating their businesses or a lot of their assets. Check your state laws on forfeiture in both criminal and civil matters. Cato.org, 800-767-1241, Book Forfeiting Our Property Rights, Is Your Property Safe from Seizure by Henry Hyde. Fear.org, Fear Chronicles, Forfeiture Endangers American Rights. OriExpress.com, 800-279-6799, Book Search. Seizure and Privacy by Darien A. McWhorter, Conventional College Textbook, Not Much Anger Against Forfeiture Laws. PrivacyRights.org IRS Guide You have to be vigilant and watch your money, especially from the IRS and lawsuits. If the IRS wants your money or have a judgment against you, the authorities carefully look your records over to try to find evidence of Fraudulent Conveyance, Uniform Fraudulent Transfers Act which means transferring your money to someone or somewhere else to avoid creditors slash legal liability. This is classified as fraud, a felony punishable by a big fine and possible jail time. In some cases, the judge can render the transactions void and go after the money. If you plan to transfer your money away from yourself or to a foreign country, you must develop a plan to do it intelligently so that they don't get you for fraud. Many trusts where you sign over something like a house or a boat but continue to use it are highly frowned upon. Theoretically, the court is supposed to show subjective fraudulent intent but the burden of proof has eased in recent years with courts convicting people for what they call badges of fraud, 
simply evidence that you have moved your assets around for no apparent reason other than their definition of fraud. Unless you have expensive lawyers, they can charge you with fraud and railroad you in court. Your best bet is to hide your money up front before you ever get into trouble either by burying some of it. Getting a safety deposit box at a private safety deposit company not a bank, because the government has access to all bank records. Putting your money into non-paper instruments like physical gold or diamonds. Opening an account in another country. Opening an account in a phony name. Opening an account through a relative or close friend. Buying assets in your relative slash friends names like homes, cars, etc. Incorporating a business shifts all liability from you personally to the corporation meaning they can't get at your car and house if you declare bankruptcy but you will be taxed twice, once at the corporate level and secondly on your personal income taxes but on the other hand, you can take a lot of corporate deductions, create a health plan, pension plan, travel, car, equipment, etc. The state of Delaware has good laws for incorporating a business. Once incorporated, there are laws protecting corporations and businesses from being plundered as well as many tax incentives unlike many other states. Delaware, the 49th smallest state, contains incorporations of over one half of all the Fortune 500 companies. Your offices can be located elsewhere but you can incorporate in Delaware. The government stays out of your business. Delaware also something called a limited liability company slash LLC which is a hybrid between a partnership and a corporation. Nevada is the second choice for incorporation with no corporate tax, no state income tax and no franchise tax. For information about incorporating a business, get a copy of the magazine Inc. Inc.com, go to the classifieds section to the business services subsection and check some of the ads out. You might find a book or two about corporations and incorporating at either number 338 or number 658-59 at the library. It gets complicated. Educate yourself before you plunge in. If you're a smart high roller, get educated about offshore tax havens and consider getting a foreign nominee to set up a foreign corporation for you or just start a bank account somewhere like in Canada for Americans, in the United States for Canadians. Paladin Press Books POG 1307 Boulder, Colorado, 80306 800-466-6868 P-A-L-A-D-I-N-P-R-E-S-S.com Some Books Lawsuits Guide If You Run a Business Try to set it up such that your personal assets are not tied into business assets so you don't have liability if there's a lawsuit against your business. Corporations are better than sole proprietorships but limited liability corporations are better still. There are limited liability companies, Section 301.7701, Federal Code of Regulations, which are a hybrid between a partnership and a corporation. It's formed the same as a partnership but structured for limited liability. Ask a good lawyer or money man about it. There are also subchapter S corporations which are too complicated for me to bother with since I'm basically a simple guy who will never set up a corporation so if you're interested, educate yourself about it. It might save you a lot of money. Don't be guilty of gross negligence in your business because they will take everything you own and send you to jail in the process. Fraudulent business practices can put you in jail for a long stretch especially with the backlash against the fat cats getting their wrists slapped for white-collar crime. This means get checks made out to your business and not to you and don't lend the business your personal money then write checks to pay your bills from the business fund because if you do, the IRS and anyone who might file a lawsuit against you will say everything is tied together and try to get it all. Lawsuits can happen to anyone. Don't underestimate the lowliness of human scum to lie, cheat, and twist the truth always to hell in court. Just watch court TV sometime. Notice how both sides have entirely different recollections of events. Someone's lying. Usually, it's a bit of both with the truth somewhere in between. Lawsuits have proliferated in this country, often for frivolous reasons. If you're a business owner or even just a private citizen, 
somebody may decide to sue you for whatever reason. The first thing a potential sewer or his or her lawyer does is to investigate to find out whether you have insurance and if so, how much. If you don't have insurance and don't own much, they probably won't bother suing you but if you act rich and flaunt your wealth, someone may pick up on it and try to get money out of you through the legal system so don't flaunt your wealth. I have seen the telephone company sue a friend of mine in small claims court, he didn't show, they won by default, put a lien on his house and when he sold it several years later, there it was with interest built on it so the lesson is watch out for the big corporations suing you for unpaid bills even if you say they're unjustified. Buy insurance to protect yourself but just get enough to protect yourself legally from a lawsuit. Do not pay for high liability levels such that you could tempt potential sewers. Your insurance company will probably take over your legal defense and manage it. If you're really worried about lawsuits, simply sign over all your assets to your spouse, kids, or trusted friends via what is called tenant in common or tenant by the entirety. This is called going naked. It may save you if someone wants a piece of you real bad. Offshore annuities are a way to protect your money because if somebody sues you, you must be sued in the country where the money is in order for them to get it. A few law firms in the US are now going after offshore assets of American citizens after they're sued in America. If you invest overseas, make sure the institution you're with is stable and the country is stable too. If you own a piece of real estate in the U.S. that's registered to your dummy corporation overseas, state law takes precedence over it and they can take it from you. Joint tenancy generally offers no protection from creditors except in the case of death where a creditor just can't move in and plunder the property because ownership is passed on to the joint owner without having to go through probate. The exception to this is that the federal and state governments can lay claim to the joint property in payment of death slash estate taxes. In community property states, the law states that each person owns 50% of the joint property so the creditor can only take half of it. The homestead exemption, which varies in every state, protects a certain amount of equity in a debtor's primary residence home if he is the head of a household. Florida and Texas have a high homestead exemption which means you can go there, buy a big farm, declare bankruptcy, and they can't touch it. If you don't have current credit problems, you can set up domestic irrevocable or living trusts and get a friend to act as trustee and your money can't be touched. If you're super savvy, consider an offshore foreign asset protection trust, apt. Contact a money manager at a foreign bank or a money manager at an international trust company and ask about it. Look them up in the phone book or on the internet. Life insurance, annuities, and retirement income are other popular exemptions which creditors can't touch. Note a famous court case where the defendant had a $34 million judgment against him yet he gets $25,000 a month pension which they can't touch. You could consider buying foreign annuities or life insurance in Switzerland. Although technically, you're not allowed to give more than $10,000 a year in gifts per person without declaring it to the IRS and paying a gift tax on it, a good way to live if you have many creditors is simply to simplify, give what you own away and live a simple life. Liability Insurance, Business The most basic line of defense in protecting your assets is property insurance and general liability insurance. You need liability insurance in case someone is injured on your property. Read the exclusions of your insurance policy to see what's not covered and see what the maximum limits are for coverage. You can be sued for ridiculous amounts of money which is why they sell liability insurance for ridiculous amounts of coverage like $10 million or so. Don't go overboard on insurance. If somebody knows that you have a lot of liability insurance, that could be enough to entice them to sue you. Liability insurance won't solve all your problems but it could give you peace of mind if you get the right type at a reasonable cap to protect you should something happen. You must be very wary of the insurance company you deal with and the specific policy you buy. The insurance industry is rife with less than honorable companies and insurance policies that are less than what you are told up front which is why you should read every line of any liability insurance policy you buy in order to know exactly what's covered, what the exclusions are and what the deductibles are, if any. There are a number of different types of insurance policies that could help you deal with the issue of liability. 1. Personal Liability Insurance 
This includes automobile liability insurance, homeowner liability insurance, in case someone slips and falls on your property, and a general umbrella policy that relates to a lot of situations you might encounter in daily life but each has a number of exclusions which you should be aware of, particularly if something is due to your negligence. 2. General Business Insurance Policy These policies are generally written to cover risks, accidents or claims that could happen within the business but as with most policies, there are many exclusions such as criminal acts, acts done outside of the business premises, acts done at the business premises but outside the scope of business, conducting business at another location like home, etc. 3. Professional Liability Insurance Policies Doctors, lawyers, architects, etc. get these policies to cover normal negligence in the course of business but there are many exclusions on these policies too such as gross negligence, criminal acts, acts that break civil laws and others. Be wary that professional liability only covers you in the conduct of you doing your profession with your customers. It doesn't shield you from lawsuits filed by your employees, by creditors, by suppliers, or by the IRS. The sad truth is that if you own a business or are a professional, the more successful and high profile you are, the more likely someone will sue you so it's wise to look into getting a good liability policy or finding another way to protect your money. Liability is not just limited to malpractice or negligence. There are many types of liability such as mistreatment of employees, discrimination, business contracts, product liability, warranties, partnership disputes, sexual harassment, tax claims, divorce claims on the business, debts, breach of contract, poor service, etc. Liability insurance policies are increasingly getting more and more narrowly defined. Even if you think something is covered, sleazy insurance companies have a way of pointing out the exclusion in the fine print to you when you file a claim so you had better know exactly what kind of insurance policy you are buying. Ridiculously astronomical judgments for relatively minor lawsuits are not beyond the realm of possibility. The question is where is the balance between forking over cash for liability coverage and reaching a level of liability coverage where you feel that you are adequately covered should you get one of these silly lawsuits filed against you? The catch-22 of having high levels of liability insurance is that lawyers investigate you to see how much liability insurance you I have. This is one criteria they use in determining whether to bother suing you or not but to top it off, they often go above whatever limit your liability insurance is for regardless of what it is and sue for more than that. You will never have enough liability coverage to shield you from overzealous, bloodthirsty lawyers so only buy so much and leave it that. Refer to the insurance ratings section elsewhere in this book for information about highly rated insurance companies that are likely to pay their claims and not go bankrupt. Once there is a claim filed against you that is covered by your insurance company, they take over the management of your case. Even if you want to fight it, they might not let you. They might go for an out-of-court settlement or urge you to plead guilty and pay the fine and the judgment whatever it might be. In other cases, you might want to settle to avoid adverse publicity while the insurance company will insist on a full-blown trial. Their bottom line is not the same as your bottom line. They're looking to get away as cheaply as possible. You're looking to protect your company and stay in business with a good reputation. Some judgments even force the company to stop producing their major product or to shut down completely and the insurance company doesn't care if it will help them pay less money. Be wary of the way your insurance company chooses to handle your lawsuit. They could agree to something that will damage or destroy your business. Every time you get sued, expect your insurance rates to rise. A counterintuitive approach to asset protection is to not get liability insurance because by virtue of having it, it makes you an attractive candidate to get sued by lawyers who check you out first to see if you have it and for how much. An alternative method is to find a good asset protection advisor slash consultant who will shield your assets through other means than go bare as it's called within the biz, have no liability insurance whatsoever but have your assets cleverly shielded through other means. When money-hungry lawyers and other potential litigants see that you have no liability insurance plus your assets are well protected legally, they won't file these lawsuits, many of which are without merit, 
just filed in a fishing expedition with lawyers and citizens hoping to make some easy money. If you are sued, you have to pay your own defense costs in court even if you end up winning. Some law firms and prepaid lawsuit companies accept an upfront retainer fee to be there willing and able to represent you should you get sued. This is proactive legal representation. There are asset protection companies that offer this proactive service too. They will be there ready to advise you should you get sued. Rather than buying expensive liability insurance policies just for themselves, some professionals in some fields in some geographic areas band together in a group or co-op and buy insurance as a collective thereby getting lower rates. Another alternative is to set up your own insurance company offshore as discussed in the captive insurance company slash CIC section. If you are an employee of a company, your employer's liability insurance may or may not cover you depending on what negligent act you do. They have many exclusions in their policies. In the end, if you pay attention to certain sectors of media, you can find a number of cases of insurance companies committing atrocious acts of injustice against their clients by denying their claims or making it difficult for them to collect. You have to be aware of exactly what your policy covers and if you feel you are being unfairly dealt with by an insurance company, you can complain to state insurance ombudsman and through other insurance organizations but your best bet is probably just to find a lawyer, not the one who works for the insurance company, and threaten a lawsuit against your insurance company. When buying insurance, it's like buying anything. Try to find a good insurance agent you can trust who is on your side as opposed to the companies even though he is one of their agents. Consider an umbrella policy which kicks in when the other policies reach their cap and covers a lot of different situations. Liability.com Chapter 2 Asset Protection 2 Bank Account for Lawsuit Protection Get a friend who will act as your nominee to open a bank account preferably at a small independent bank in a different state from where you live. Use a local hotel address, a mail forwarding service in that state or simply use the address in your home state and say you are planning to move to the area within the next year or so. Either get mail order checks or make your own on your computer. Specify that you want only the initials of your nominee on them as opposed to the full name. The checks will be sent to the address you want printed on them. Most mail order check companies will not send checks to an address other than the one on the checks themselves. When the checks arrive, get your nominee to sign all 200 of them. Pay him $100 and you should both be happy. Equity Stripping Ideas Mortgaging yourself to the hilt is often used as an asset protection strategy also called equity stripping for asset protection. You can own lots of assets but if, at the same time, you have loans or mortgages out on all or most of these assets such that you have almost zero equity in them then creditors or lawsuit judgments won't touch them because there is money owed on them, sometimes more money than what the thing is worth in the marketplace. When lawyers go looking to decide whether to file a lawsuit against somebody, they do a computer search on a person or a business which reveals all assets plus liabilities. If you own a house with no mortgage free and clear, its full value would come up as an asset owned by you but if you were to get a big home equity loan approximately 75% of the value of the home which is the value they usually give then your holdings look that much less attractive because your equity in the house would only appear as 25% of its value whereas before, it was 100% of its value. If a lawyer sees that you owe all this money, he might not bother filing a lawsuit against you. You can get a home equity loan without actually borrowing any money. Pay the loan processing fee and get a line of credit equal to 75% of the value of your house. As soon as you get this line of credit loan, regardless of whether you take a dime out, your own personal equity in the home goes down by 75% on computer records. You can do this for virtually all of your big assets. It is called an encumbrance. Get a loan using these assets as collateral and a third-party lien is immediately placed on it. Sometimes you don't avoid lawsuits this way but if you get a lawsuit judgment against you, you show them all your debts and they're willing to settle with you for much less than if your assets were visible free and clear. You could set up an IBC, International Business Corporation. 
an LLC or a corporation and have that entity either lend you money or have them perform a service for you for a fee whereupon they put a third-party encumbrant on some of your assets. This muddles the waters such that a creditor will have to investigate this company that you owe money to. If it's an IBC, that's great since it's offshore but if they find that it's a shell company as opposed to a real one, they will disallow this and tell you to pay up. Some people even go further. They ask a friend to file some kind of civil lawsuit against them then get a massive judgment against them which protects them if anybody else comes along later and decides to sue them since the first judgment has to be paid off fittest before the defendant starts paying other judgments off. People get a friendly lender to loan them money on paper such that there is a mortgage on their business which is first in line to collect debts should something happen. Then, if worse comes to worse and the business gets swamped with other debts over and above this mortgage, there is either a bankruptcy or this friendly lender forecloses, calls in his loan, seizes the assets of the business whereupon he sells or gives them back to you, the business owner, whereupon you start up under a new business name. Some crafty people become their own creditors. They set up a Nevada corporation. An IBC or a New Mexico LLC with nominee owners which either loans their business a lot of money, supplies a lot of widgets to the business on paper does consulting work or does a lot of services to the business on paper such that the business owes this Nevada corporation. IBC or New Mexico LLC a lot of money. Make sure you document all these alleged services slash invoices with impeccable paperwork even if it is all a sham. Can you show cancelled checks proving you are making payments on this loan slash mortgage by a friendly lender? Can you show what supplies they sold you or exactly what work they did for you? Savvy creditors will scrutinize these loans slash mortgages slash services slash goods sold by friends, relatives, and acquaintances. If it comes to pass that there are a lot of other creditors in line, the friendly creditor, who has the biggest loan outstanding and is first in line, calls in the loan, picks up all the company's assets, the other creditors are left out in the cold then the friendly creditor sells all these assets it picked up back to the business owner and he reopens under a new business name owing this creditor all that money for the equipment he just bought. If you can get a secured bank loan in exchange for collateral in the business, the bank becomes your major creditor. If your business fails, the bank and other creditors stand in line to sell off some of your assets to collect at least part of their loans back. The bank already has a claim on some of your major business assets through the secured loan but if you manage to pay them back through the sale of other assets, they give you the assets they held as collateral back. If you can get somebody to co-sign a business loan for you, you pledge your collateral to this person who pledges it to the bank. If the business goes bankrupt, as long as you or your co-signer pay the loan off, those business assets are safe. They will not be plundered in the bankruptcy proceeding. There will be interest payments on any loans you get but you can minimize that by putting the money into a high yield bond or money market account to minimize these interest charges. Before you attempt to set up a third party secured lien arrangement on your business, talk to an expert about it and ask about how your income taxes through the business will be affected by it. Hawala slash Hundi Banking Hawala slash Hundi Banking is a technique used by trusted associates to exchange money across international borders. It is good for the fact that since no cash money actually moves anywhere, you don't risk getting caught trying to leave the country with a stash over $10,000. As far as I understand it, it's used when you want to smuggle money into or out of the United States without arousing suspicion from the IRS or the drug smuggling patrol. Let's say you want to smuggle some money out to your pad in Jamaica. Among trusted associates, you write your buddy Joe Rastafarian an American personal or business check for $50,000, for alleged business consultation or rental of his exclusive mansion for three months in case the feds ask later. He cashes this check then he writes you a local check to be cashed at a local bank with your account which houses the stash you're hiding from the IRS. For money laundering purposes, get the cash straight up with his check and you've just crossed an international border and gotten $50,000 less what you paid him, in the local currency and you didn't need to take the risk of illegally leaving the US. With more than $10,000 bucks on you. Another way is to buy a good piece of real estate overseas in a stable country like Jamaica so now you have a legal deed for property. 
everything is above board if the feds come asking you what this $100,000 check is for. You produce a photocopy of the deed or even the original. After all, it's only a document that can be easily duplicated but the hook is that you immediately put the house on the market again for a slightly higher price. A short time later, you sell the house and get a check in the local currency. You've just successfully gotten $100,000 out of the United States without risking getting caught by the IRS. Chapter 3 Asset Protection 3 Live Without a Bank Account Illegal aliens, fugitives, hippies, criminals, and paranoid people often don't have bank accounts mostly because they fear the government will either find them this way or take their money. If you do not have a bank account, you can take your checks to a check cashing business and pay a fee between 3% and 5% of the total amount. If you don't believe in bank accounts, don't tell anybody you don't have a bank account and don't tell anyone you save your money at home. Save your cash in the basement, preferably in some kind of steel or plastic container to avoid deterioration. Hide it in the walls or if there's dirt in your basement, put it down a few inches in a plastic or steel container. Illegal aliens get their paychecks, get them cashed at the bank, get some money orders made which they send home to their families and pay all their bills by cash. If you run a cash business and don't want the IRS to know all the money you're making, you had better dig a hole in your basement and hide a safe in it to put your cash that you don't want to declare on your taxes. I knew a guy who ran a pizza business. He didn't want the IRS to know about all the money he was making so he kept all his cash at home. After a while, it was meaningless. He had stashes of cash everywhere in his house. The problem with that is if the wrong people find out you have a stash of cash, they won't think twice about killing you for it. If you're hiding your cash in your house, aside from a spouse and a brother or sister, don't tell anyone. So-called friends kill each other for several hundred bucks. If you hide your life savings in your house, Hide it well enough such that IRS agents won't find it in the event of a search warrant. Another advantage of no bank account is that you don't have to write checks thereby not inadvertently revealing your address which are on all checks. If it's not convenient to pay cash, mail a postal money order, a cashier's check or a traveler's check. You can buy money orders in supermarkets and at corner convenience stores. Without a checking account or a credit card, you don't have to worry about identity theft and people getting credit in your name. Check fraud is rampant. If you pay anyone with a check like a shady mail order dealer or a fly-by-night grass cutter, he can take the check and either print up duplicates on his own or get a check mail order company to print up new ones for him with a new address. Prepaid legal services. If you run a business, you can buy peace of mind from lawsuits by investing in a prepaid legal services plan. These usually cost under $50 a month and you get unlimited consultation, will preparation, IRS tax audit service, representation in civil court, etc. If you're a general family man, you can still subscribe to these services for peace of mind. Contact the following for more information, look in your phone book or internet telephone directories and type prepaid legal services into search engines. Some of these companies may be on the scamish side but some are good. Think of it as legal insurance in case you get sued or something happens. APLZI.org, American Prepaid Legal Services Institute. eHow.com, How to Buy Prepaid Legal Services. Prepaid Legal Services Review.com. Prepaid Legal Information.com. Prepaid Legal Plans.ws. PREPAID-LEGAL-SERVICES.BIZ PREPAIDLEGALSERVICES.COM PREPAID-LEGAL-SERVICES.NET PREPAIDLEGALSERVICES.NBG.COM American Prepaid Legal Services Institute 541 North Fairbanks Court Chicago, Illinois, 60611 312-988-5751 APLZI.org Ask for list of prepaid legal services companies. Using people as nominees. Look at a nominee as some person, bank, institute, or company that takes your place as the publicly perceived owner or manager of your assets who opens a bank account for you, 
gets a phone in their name for you, etc. To my knowledge, there are two ways of using nominees. Set yourself up as a, preferably offshore, corporation. Get another person to put your assets in their name and get a notarized power of attorney for them. Corporate Method The idea behind using a nominee is to hide the real you as a person from public view, in essence, to be invisible as a person money and asset-wise as well as to set yourself up as a corporation for all intents and purposes which are limited liability business ventures, meaning that as long as there is no fraud involved, the corporation is legally separate from the individual which means they can't come after you for loans made to the corporations or bills due. To use a nominee simply means that you set your assets up as being owned by a corporation you created rather than being owned by you the person. This is even more secure for you if your corporation is located offshore like on one of the Caribbean islands or in Canada. If you have a lot of money, if you want legal protection in case you get sued or the tax man comes calling, in my opinion, set up offshore as a nominee corporation, get a lot of your money there in that bank account. You could do this electronically but you're supposed to declare all money over $10,000 taken out of the U.S. To the IRS and banks are obligated to report it to the U.S. Treasury Department through the Bank Secrecy Act. When leaving the country by airplane, your luggage is inspected for weapons, generally not for money but if you take a cruise ship or drive into Canada, American agents don't inspect you when you leave and American cash is generally not considered contraband when you enter most nations so they don't care if you got a luggage full of cash if they think you're just hiding it from the American tax man but if you look like a crook or a terrorist, they might detain you to try to find out why you have all that cash and you're leaving the US with it. After you set an account up as a nominee corporation, Ask them for a credit card or ATM card with a high daily cash limit like $500 or $1,000 and you pretty well got available cash anywhere in the world. There is much less legal liability with a credit card than an ATM card if it gets stolen and somebody starts using it. With a credit card, your liability should be $50 only, with an ATM card, a thief could conceivably drain your account and you would liable for it all. As an added security feature, you could request the bank to put a condition on your card such that if it's used for a cash withdrawal more than two days in a row, close it down until they contact you and find out what's going in. This shouldn't be too hard to do. Person as nominee. Offer a friend who doesn't work therefore doesn't file tax returns $500 to use his identity to do things with it like buy property, open accounts, etc. The reason you don't want him filing taxes is because if the IRS does an audit, they will locate all this money and possessions and call it undeclared income. Get a relative or close friend to act as your nominee as a favor. Use somebody over 65 who doesn't do much of anything. Ask them if you can put a few accounts and houses in their name while giving you a notarized power of attorney over these assets. Do not use a lover as a nominee. When the love goes south, he or she is the legal owner of everything in their name, not you even though you really own it. Make up a limited power of attorney form either with a lawyer or by yourself then get your nominee, preferably someone who doesn't own much and therefore, for all intents and purposes, looks judgment proof from civil lawsuits to the average person. Sign over your assets to them but in your form you give yourself legal power of attorney over these assets and put a stipulation in that if they die, ownership goes to you. If you die, they take sole control of the assets. Get this form notarized and you're all set. Nominees could conceivably do everything for you like rent or buy a house, get a bank or brokerage account, buy a car, buy car insurance, get utilities in his or her name, etc. Another way is the limited liability company discussed elsewhere. Asset Protection Websites AssetProtection.com Auxiliarylia.com, Falsi.com, Gcapress.com, Book Asset Protection Secrets, Plenum.com, Book Mind Your Own Business, The Battle for Personal Privacy by Jeannie Graham Scott, RPIFS.com.